Welcome to Her Voice, a show that highlights female game changers from the Middle East. I'm your host, Kumada Ramanathan. Today, we focus on the plight of Middle Eastern women in the UK asylum system. According to the UK Border Agency, roughly 4,300 people claiming to be of Middle Eastern descent applied for asylum in the UK in 2012. Over 1,800 individuals were granted asylum, just over 1,600 were refused. The United Kingdom, along with other countries signed on to the refugee convention over 60 years ago. This commits the government to give asylum to those fleeing persecution on grounds of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. But women can face unique challenges such as sexual persecution. That's why the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees recognized the need to interpret the convention in a gender sensitive manner. Our next guest is Catherine Platt of Platt & Associates. She sheds light on how the UK courts have applied these international covenants and how the system has treated women of Middle Eastern descent. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we spoke a little earlier about some of the unique legal protections that South Asian as well as Middle Eastern women are afforded in the UK asylum system. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Well, firstly, I think we need to have a look at the general principles surrounding asylum law. And uh, asylum is not a visa category. It's, it's not uh, the same sort of thing as coming in as a student or as the spouse of a, a British citizen. It is a unique um, protection category that is afforded to people who have a refugee convention reason for fearing persecution. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a person needs to have a well-founded fear of persecution for a convention reason, such as race, ethnicity, gender, being a member of a social group, um, or for holding a political opinion. They need to be outside of their country of nationality, uh, and they fear returning to the, uh, their, their country. They're unwilling to return to their country as a result of this well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, in the UK uh, case law, there has been some uh, discussion around what constitutes social group and membership of a social group. And for Southeast Asian women and Middle Eastern women, um, there have been cases in the past where women who have uh, faced death sentences on, on the grounds of being so falsely accused of adultery uh, have been recognized as a social group for the purposes of protection, uh, uh, convention protection. In other instances, there have been uh, women of Middle Eastern origin who have received recognition and p protection because they are members of a family group uh, where members of their family have been detained and, and persecuted for holding political opinions, for example. So I think one, one has to be very aware that there are strict requirements or to be fulfilled to be recognized for refugee protection. Where one doesn't fulfill that, those, those requirements, there may still be humanitarian or subsidiary protection available to such individuals, or they may be granted uh, protection or discretionary leave to remain outside of the rules uh, on human rights grounds. So the, the notion of asylum, humanitarian protection, and, and human rights protection is a different kind of way of being uh, recognized and protected and, and given leave in, in the UK versus a, a visa-based system. And asylum is not an economic migration uh, category. It's, it's not a, a family-based category. It is a protection mechanism. Okay. Now, we spoke earlier also about some of the precedents that have been set in particular cases in the past. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Well, when one looks at, at precedents, the, the courts will, will look at each of the requirements in the Refugee Convention to see whether that uh, fear is ongoing and, and current, whether that fear is well-founded or not, both on subjective and objective uh, elements and terms. And then they will see whether that person does fit in uh, to, to a, a category of protection for convention reasons. Um, so so that, that is what they look at. So the precedents are set by the courts examining these requirements, these, these underlying convention requirements in international law, and how they are applied to people who have um, claimed asylum on the basis of being refugees. Uh, when, when someone is, is looking at asylum claims, uh, 
there's also the question of whether the person can relocate to another part of their country, whether it, they are, are fearing persecution from the state, a state actor or a non-state actor, and in the event of, of fearing persecution from a non-state actor, uh, what steps that person has taken to um, seek protection through a normal criminal justice system procedures. Uh, what's also looked at is whether a person has approached international organizations in their country of residence, uh, such as Amnesty International or women, women's organizations or the Red Cross or, or whatever the case may be, to seek protection or, or assistance. And uh, these, these are all things that go towards assessing the credibility of a person's claim in asylum. But I, I would like to stress that asylum um, is something that someone claims when they are outside of their country of, of residence. Okay. Now, there are specific examples of, uh, I believe, a woman from Pakistan as well as someone from Iran that you mentioned were important in terms of setting the groundwork for future cases in asylum. Yes. They, they'd had uh, women from, from these, these regions or countries had, um, and even Iraq, had um, uh, claimed asylum uh, in, in terms of, of their, their uh, membership of a, of, of a certain group. And I think that that's, that's important to, to recognize. They had had their, their claims refused, otherwise they would not have gone to court um, to, to have their, their uh, asylum claims reassessed. And the courts had, in their investigations, looked at the law and looked at the facts of their case. And uh, in, the, in the case of the Pakistani ladies, they had uh, said, well, look, these ladies face uh, potential execution on the basis of uh, false claims of adultery. And they would, would form part of a social group, in our opinion, and, and we, we therefore think that they, they are uh, refugees in line with the convention reasons. Um, and then in, in, in other instances, the court have, has looked at, at women from the Middle East uh, in, in uh, instances where their family members have been detained uh, on the basis of holding p certain political convictions. These ladies have not been detained, but their family members have been detained. But as a result of these ladies being members of these family groups, they have been held by the courts to be members of a social group. Uh, and their fear of, of persecution has, has been uh, regarded as, as credible. So they have been recognized as refugees. Okay, very interesting. Now we have one video to share of Indido, local Syrian woman and her mother's experience in the asylum system. Let's take a look right now. These Syrian women are waiting in the wings of the UK asylum system. They claim they can't return to their native country because they feared they'll be killed by the government. For their safety, we're concealing their identity. And my dad think if I come, come here in holiday in my country to just study take the course for English and uh, prove my English to come back to my country to complete my study. The 18-year-old and her mother came to the UK on visitors' visas, but a one-month trip turned into a year-and-a-half ordeal for them. Days after arriving, the teen says her mother received a call from her husband's lawyer in Syria. He said the teen's father had been arrested and jailed. It's still not clear to either women if he's dead or alive. I didn't know what I think, just surprised and crying a lot because that's my dad and my country now dangerous and it's very difficult somebody tell you don't back to your country because your country they will kill you. It's very difficult. The teen says their asylum claims are based on fears they'll be persecuted for her father and their political beliefs. Their first application was rejected. They submitted a new claim over nine months ago. As they wait for a decision, they can't work legally. Instead, they rely heavily on donations from Asylum Welcome, a UK charity. Money, we don't have any money. Like, just uh, we take it food from, here, from Asylum Welcome. Waiting for a decision also means putting the teen's dreams of attending university on hold. Despite the fact that her future remains unclear, the teen says she clings to the belief her own version of a happy ending is possible. For me, I just want to live in peace with my family, uh, study, make my future, have my job, uh, be successful in my life. 
Catherine, you heard that particular story, obviously very disturbing. Uh, there's a number of issues that can be gleaned from it. Can you tell me what are some of the overarching ones that you found interesting? Well, firstly, I think the ladies came in initially to study English, um, and then they, they claimed asylum when they were here. Generally, a person needs to claim asylum at the earliest opportunity uh, when they come to the UK, or at the earliest opportunity when they, they do feel that they satisfy the, the uh, convention reasons for claiming asylum. Um, when one does claim uh, asylum, uh, there can be delays uh, for while the Secretary of State is considering uh, a person's claim. Um, and the Secretary of State uh, would investigate all claims for asylum, assessing credibility and, and the facts claimed uh, to establish that a person is a refugee in line with the requirements in the, the 1951 A Convention. Uh, and I think what this lady is experiencing are, are long delays as a result of processing um, backlogs that are, are being experienced. Uh, she's also mentioned the problem of financial resources available to people who, while they're going through the asylum process. Now, unfortunately, that is something that we see quite often. Um, I would always say to people to seek uh, professional advice early uh, where they are intending to make an asylum claim. Um, they need to be obtaining a, a advice from appropriately, appropriately regulated professionals uh, in the immigration field when they do seek advice. Uh, if they, they, they need to start off somewhere. So I think it would be a good idea if they went to their local Citizens Advice Bureau, if they're in the UK, to ascertain what, what would be the normal requirements for them. Uh, they should go to, to a, a lawyer, an immigration lawyer, appropriately regulated immigration lawyer, to get professional confidential legal advice on whether they do satisfy the requirements of the convention uh, and what, what process is involved to make an asylum claim. Uh, Ladies have to go for interviews as well as men who claim asylum and they have to uh, set out their case fully at the interview. Um, they need to provide any evidence that they are relying on uh, in, in order to claim asylum in line with the convention reasons and requirements. And yes, the Secretary of State may undertake her investigations to see whether this person does satisfy those requirements before recognizing them. But yes, delays and, and access to financial resources are, are an issue for a lot of people at the moment. Beyond those particular issues, are there others that you think should be addressed in the near future by the federal government in order to improve the system? European law seeks to harmonize or harmonizes the way that member states uh, can consider and process uh, asylum or refugee claims. So um, I think it, it's, it's something to be addressed in, in terms of European law and, and, and how, how Britain uh, has its, its obligations in terms of international law as well. But generally speaking, it's, it's the delays that must be addressed. And these are, are efficiency questions. But I think um, in terms of policy, it would be, it, it's always wise to, um, to have caseworkers with a background and understanding of the, the, the issues that are faced by people who come from certain regions, who have experience in assessing these claims and also assessing uh, the, and, and, and asking appropriate questions to elicit relevant information. So I think, I think that, is, that is the key. Uh, Britain has, has international obligations, European law obligations, and they will also need to look at, at getting the process smoothly and efficiently taken care of. Welcome back to the show. Our next guest is Dr. John Campbell, senior anthropology expert at the University of London. He discusses the impact of linguistic testing on asylum applicants. Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for joining us on our show today. Can you tell me what is linguistic analysis testing and how does it take place in terms of the asylum application process? Certainly. Um, in the, in the, uh, for the UK Border Agency, the Home Office here in Britain, um, language analysis was announced as a policy in 2001. The original impetus was the, the notion that the Home Office had that there were many fraudulent asylum applicants making claims. And what they did is they sought to borrow policy being pursued elsewhere in Europe and in Australia. And the policy was to record uh, an interview with particular asylum applicants 
and to have that uh, record um, analyzed by linguists in another country, a private firm that, that was doing this, to determine whether the individual who was claiming asylum actually derived from the country of origin that they claimed to be coming from. And the idea was to detect fraudulent claims. It, it has two, two to three linked key elements. The policy is claimed to be scientific. So that means that there has to be, they have to follow key established procedures, both in recording um, um, the interview, also in selecting which individuals should be subjected to a language analysis, because it, it's been announced on a pilot basis, and only individuals from specific countries have been required or compelled to do this. So not everyone coming to Britain seeking asylum has been, has been. But it's largely been targeted on countries where there have been a large number or a large influx of individuals seeking asylum. So it's recorded. Um, the, there's an interview which takes place over the phone with the private firm in Sweden which does this. The average interview is about 20 minutes. Most of the conversation is the interviewer who's supposed to be speaking to the interviewee, the asylum applicant, in their first or native language. And then they're asking them to speak to answer particular questions. The purpose of the, uh, of the language analysis is twofold. The first is to further question them for information about their claimed country of origin. All right. The second is to analyze the language that they're using. So, so that's the point. That's the point of language analysis. Within a very short period of time, that Swedish firm then provides a report to the border agency, the case owner who's handling that particular asylum case. And, and that's a, a four to five page document which, which, allocate, which, which answers or discusses their answers to the country of origin information and which gives them a brief analysis of the language. Okay? That decision is then supposed to be used by the border agency official together with other information which is available, available to them through the asylum process to come to a decision on the, on the case. Okay. Now, based on your peer-reviewed research, you have argued that the linguistic testing has been used as a political tool of the federal government. Can you explain in your own words? This was originally announced in 2001 as a pilot. The pilot has been extended uh, through 2010. Um, and through the pilot, one firm in Sweden has been contracted to, to do this information. Right. Now, there are serious problems in, in the way that the border agency officials follow their established procedures, which are set out in what's called an asylum policy instruction. If they fail to follow the instructions in that document, then the testing could potentially be unlawful and should be overturned in the court. The procedures for, rev for reviewing or recording and analyzing the language can also be problematic. First of all, in that 20-minute interview, it's mostly the interviewee undertaking, the, you know, asking the questions. So there's a very limited opportunity for the asylum applicant to answer in their own language. We also know from, from different asylum claims which have, have been based on language analysis that often the interviewee in that Swedish firm is not using the first language of that person. They're using another language. So, for example, many of the individuals who, who were coming from Somalia were not interviewed in Somali, their claimed first language, but in Kiswahili, the first language of the rest of the subregion of East Africa. And that led to a number of refusals based on, on a decision that they were not speaking their first language. So there's, there's a flawed process here. In addition, when, when the reports come, the case owners also tend to rely on that refusal rather than to take into consideration other evidence they have, they have before them. So all this purports to a kind of a, 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 a an illusion of scientificity, right? When in fact uh, there are a series of flawed processes which underlie the the entire policy. Based on those observations, let's talk about a recent announcement by the Home Office. In this announcement, it says testing will be used when an asylum claimant's true place of origin is in doubt. This applies to people claiming to be from Kuwait, Palestine, or Syria. Now, claimants can refuse to take part, but such a move will be taken into account when determining whether an applicant has assisted in establishing the facts of their case. Now, the announcement goes on to say that this decision is based on statistical evidence from October 
October 2011 to May 2012, where tested those claiming to be from Kuwait, for instance, were shown in 26 out of 33 cases, or 79% of cases, to not actually be from Kuwait. None of the 12 claiming to be from Palestine were from that country and the 12 of the 15 applicants, or 80%, from October 2011 to July 2012, a wider pool of uh, examination, were found to not be from Syria. So can you tell me, Dr. Campbell, what are your thoughts on this statistical justification? Well, th there, are, there are two problems with, with this data. First, it is a selective use of existing border agency home office information. I'll give you the broader figures from which these are drawn. But second, there, there may well be a problem of fraudulent asylum applications, which is a, which is a legitimate issue. The question is, how do we uh, assess, how should we be assessing lawfully a claim for asylum? Let me give you the figures first, okay? And these are, these are from published Home Office figures on asylum applications. In 2012, there were 93 applications from, from uh, Kuwait of whom 48 were granted some form of leave, not necessarily asylum, but perhaps a discretionary leave. So the figures uh, quoted in the Home Office statement right, indicated that they were looking at 33 cases. So 33 out of uh, 93 is one third of the total caseload. So, so there's a problem with their statistics. If we look at um, claims, uh, individuals claiming to be from Palestine, in 2012, there were 213 individuals claiming to be from Palestine, of whom they gave grants to 662. Sorry, of whom they gave grants to 24. My apologies. All right. So they're clearly, the Home Office is clearly suspicious here. But um, on what basis were the 22 refused? Was it language analysis? It's, it's not clear from those statistics. Um, the Syrian case is even more interesting for two reasons, but let me give you the figures first. In 2012, there were 992 applications, and the Home Office um, gave some form of discretionary leave to enter or a grant of asylum in 662 cases, so roughly 66% of all cases. But the number of Assyrian, Assyrian cases, clearing claims, are growing. Now, this is not just in the United Kingdom, this is a, a globally, because of the current crisis in Syria, all right? Um, last year, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees issued a directive to Europe and, and to as asylum uh, refugee-taking countries that they reckoned that the vast majority of individuals fleeing from Syria should be recognized as bona fide refugees and given at least some form of discretionary protection. The UK is clearly providing a, r a relatively high degree of protection. But there are other countries in Europe which provide no protection at all. And if you look at the statistics across Europe, there are, there, there are variable recognitions from, from, from granting most Syrian applicants some form, of, some form of protection to granting none at all some form of protection. So there's a clearious, serious difficulties here in recognizing Syrians. And it's because there are, there are fears of an influx of Syrians. Finally, can you tell me, do you think linguistic analysis should be included in the decision-making process at all? No, there, there are two, three good reasons why it should not be included. First, if you speak to a professional linguist, the current tests cannot determine, as, as they're conducted in, in terms of determining country of origin, language analysis cannot, does not correlate with a specific nationality. The reason for that is, is twofold. Populations are dispersed across many countries, all right? So the easiest example is, is looking at Afghanis. It was, this test was imposed first in 2001, primarily against Afghanis and Somalis. But if you look at the distribution of the Afghan and Somali population, it is distributed across broad regions, okay? So if you're, if you're living outside your country of origin, if you've been forced out as a young child, as a refugee living in Pakistan, your language is going to be inflected in different ways with Urdu or, or other aspects of the language in which amongst the people you've settled. So you will be found, almost guaranteed, you will be found not to be a bona fide um, Afghani and your, and your claim will be refused. The, the second issue has, has to do with the mapping of, a, of a, a language onto a national population as well. Currently, most of, most of the state boundaries are less than 100 years old. Language testing cannot correlate an individual and their, their, their ability to speak a language with a particular national territory. 
not simply because of the movement of population, but because the language analysis isn't, cannot provide that surety of definition. And third, this is a costly policy, right? There's been a criticism of the border agency decision-making for, for over a decade. And the criticism is this, that in 95% of initial applications for asylum, 95% of all those applications are refused in the first instance by the immigration caseworkers. And then they impose additional criteria, for example, the language, language testing, which is expensive. We are at a time of austerity these days, and the Home Office is, is required to make savings. If, if there are such serious problems with language analysis, why then is the Home Office using good money to chase bad policy, when many of the cases will be overturned in the court? So my general argument is that the Home Office here should, should cease pursuing language analysis. Her voice contacted the Home Office for an official comment on Dr. John Campbell's statements. According to their spokesperson, language analysis testing is only one of the tools used by the Home Office to help resolve issues of nationality. A decision will not be based on language analysis alone. Now I want to thank all of my guests on today's show. Do you know a Middle Eastern woman who went through the asylum system? Well, we want to hear from you. Share your thoughts at levant.tv forward slash her voice. Have a great day.